Hello again, students all over Bhutan. Today, I'm going to give a second lesson about capacitors, those tiny little electronic components which are a key to almost every electronic device we have. And you'll remember a capacitor, there's the spelling. The first thing a capacitor does is store energy. We recall that a capacitor is simply made of two conductors plus a dielectric, which is an insulator, which is between the two conductors. And you remember last time I made a capacitor with two sheets of tin foil. I've stiffened them up a bit today by wrapping them round two of my loser cards. And here's one conductor, here's the other, and if I put a sheet of paper towel in between the two, then I have made a capacitor. Two conductors with an insulator in between. And remember that I can change things. I can make the sheets bigger. I can make them nearer or further apart. And I can change the material that is between the two conductors. I can even just have air between the two conductors. And that is a capacitor too. So, the capacitance depends on the surface area of the plates, the distance apart, and the material that is in between. So you can realize then that if I change any one of those, if I move them like that, I'm changing the capacitance. If I change the material between them, I'm changing the capacitance. And it's this property that makes capacitors really useful. And capacitors are absolutely essential to so many of our devices. One of the things that they're very useful for is this. As you charge up the capacitor by connecting it to a battery, you can control how quickly the voltage between the two plates rises. If I connected this to a 12 volt battery, then electrons would move from one plate to the other, so I'd have net positive charge here, negative charge there. But the rate at which that happens can be controlled by putting a resistor in series with the battery, and the voltage across these plates will rise to 12 volts, the voltage of the battery, but it doesn't just go whoosh like that, it goes like that. And how quickly it does it depends on the resistor that's in the series with the battery. So I can use capacitors for timing things because I can control how quickly the voltage rises. And if I connect this and have a little light here and connect it to a 12 volt battery, as the capacitor charges, the voltage will rise, then suddenly it will whiz through a little neon bulb, and the neon bulb will flash. So, first thing, capacitors can be used in timing circuits. And you will come across that, most obviously, in flashing lights with luck. See those lights flashing on and off? That's working because a capacitor is charging up and then tch, discharging through the bulb. Charge up, tch, charge up, tch and that's happening quite rapidly, to make the lights flash. So wherever you get flashing lights, it's a capacitor that's doing it for you. Um, but also, capacitors are really useful in a mobile phone in several ways. The first way, if I can get the camera up on my mobile phone, you've got a mobile phone, and if I take a photo, and it's not very light, with luck, it will flash. I have to point it the other way. You see the flash there? Well, that happens because a capacitor is charged up in the mobile phone, and when I press the take the photo button, tsh, the energy in the capacitor goes through a little uh, LED, causing it to produce a very bright light. 
And one of the really useful things about capacitors is that they can be used to give a lot of energy very quickly. So whereas a battery gives a lot of energy for a long time, it doesn't do it very quickly. A capacitor, whoosh, can give an enormous shot of energy quite suddenly. And so timing circuits, giving a large amount of energy very suddenly, and that's exemplified in the flash in your mobile phone. But also one of the most useful things of capacitors is this. There's one plate, a conducting plate of a capacitor. Now, my hand is a conductor. And if I move my hand nearer or further from the plate, I'm in creating a capacitor. And if I move my hand around, I'm altering the capacitance of this arrangement here. So if I, there is a piece of metal on a door and I go like that, then it can operate a switch which will make the door open automatically. So sensing is really important. And anywhere where you get switches where you don't actually have to press the switch in, you just touch it, they work by altering the capacitance of a little conductor there. So touch switches work with capacitors. Another interesting thing that works with capacitors, here's my mobile phone, and I've got a touch screen on the mobile phone. Boosh, I can take a photo. Touch screens work exactly like that. Imagine the screen is one side of a capacitor, and as I touch, I'm altering the capacitance of the capacitor in the screen. That can be detected by an electronic circuit, and I will have a whole series of little wires which can detect exactly where my finger is changing the capacitance, and that is sensed by the electronics, and so I can operate things with a touch screen. iPads, here's my iPad. Here are pictures of capacitors, and this whole screen is millions and millions of capacitors. So when I touch the screen somewhere, I'm altering the capacitance in a little tiny bit of the screen, and this is sensed by the very complicated electronic circuitry, and so my iPad touch screen works by capacitance. My hand is one side of the capacitor, and the inside of the screen is the other side. So instead of two plates like that, I've got one plate and my finger, and it can sense where my finger is. And so if we look, secondly, at a fuel gauge. Now, you know a fuel gauge in a motor car, it works by a little float that goes up and down inside the tank and tells you how much petrol or diesel there is in the car. If we take an aeroplane, then the fuel gauge is very, very important because if the plane runs out of fuel halfway from Bangkok to Timpu, it will never actually get to Paro. How does that work? How do you measure the amount of fuel in an aeroplane tank? Well, you have a capacitor there, and there's air there, but if I fill the tank with fuel, the fuel comes up here, and so you're altering the material between the two plates in the tank of the aeroplane. So as the fuel comes up, the capacitance changes. That can be measured by an electronic circuit, and it tells you how much fuel there is. As the fuel goes up and down, the capacitance between these two plates changes, and that's how the fuel gauge in the Drucker Airbus works, through capacitance. And uh, one other thing, I said that uh, a capacitor can give out a lot of energy very suddenly. And I'd like you to see if you know the answer to this question. What is the common thing between your mobile phone and a nuclear bomb? What does your mobile phone and a nuclear bomb have in common? Your mobile phone works 
with a touch screen which works by capacitance. A nuclear bomb works with capacitance too. Because to make a nuclear bomb explode, you have to take two lumps of uranium and with an explosion all around, force them together. And then you get an atomic explosion. How do you get these pieces of uranium poof, to all come together suddenly? Answer, you have a number of capacitors all around the uranium, all around the uranium, which set off an explosion with ordinary gunpowder. So phew, these capacitors suddenly give their energy simultaneously all the way around and phew, they force the uranium to come together in a ball. Now, it's really important that these capacitors work well, because if they went off here but not there, phew, there'd be an explosion that would just blow the uranium away. It's important they all work at the same time to a millionth of a second. And so the only way of doing that is by storing the energy in capacitors and then psh, they all give off their energy at the same time. So next time you think of a nuclear bomb, remember your mobile phone. They share things in common. Well, uh, we've talked too about storing the energy in the camera flash. But what I want to do now is just to give a couple of worked examples about calculations involving capacitors in series and parallel. So I'm going to tear off this. Remember, this sticks to the wall of my room by electric charges. Positive on here, negative on the wall, and so it sticks to the wall. Let's look at a little example of two capacitors in series, one after the other, and let's work out what one single capacitance would be that is equivalent to those two. What is the one single capacitance that could replace those two capacitors in series? Well, they're in series, so we have to use that formula. So, 1 over C equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, so therefore, 1 over C is equal to 1 over 10 plus 1 over 5. Now, very important in doing these calculations to make sure your units for each capacitor are the same. Microfarads and microfarads. You can't mix microfarads and farads or microfarads and picofarads. They have to be the same unit. So 1 over 10 microfarads and 1 over 5 microfarads. So 1 over C therefore equals common denominator 10. 10 into 10 goes once plus 5 into 10 goes twice. Answer 3 over 10. But that isn't the final answer because we always must, when doing these 1 overs, be very careful to check it's 1 over C which equals 3 over 10. So therefore C, you have to turn that upside down, will equal 10 over 3, which equals 3.33 microfarads. Always remember when doing these reciprocal formulas to check at the end that you flip the thing to get C and you don't end up giving us the answer 3 over 10. It's 10 over 3, 3.33 microfarads. So it's quite simple as long as you take care that it's 1 over C. Now let's put these two capacitors in parallel. So now instead of being like that, they're like this. And we can charge them up with a battery. 10 microfarads, 5 microfarads. And that's dead easy. They're in parallel. So it's this formula here. So therefore C, the single capacitor that would replace those two, is equal simply to C1 plus C2, which is equal to 10 plus 5, which equals 15 microfarads. So you see in series 
is the one over formula. In parallel, it's dead easy. You just add them up. And the most difficult thing of all about the parallel calculation is to get the right number of L's when you spell the word parallel. So that's dead easy. Now, the next example I want to do is where you get series and parallel together. And provided you split up your calculation, then it's dead simple. Here we've got three capacitors and 12 microfarad there, a 4 microfarad there, a 2 microfarad there. Question, what single capacitor can replace or be equivalent to that combination of three capacitors? Now, it looks a bit more complicated, but it's not. Because all you have to do is say, right, what actually we've got. What we've got is two capacitors in parallel there, and they are in series with the 12 microfarad. So let's work out what these add up to. The 4 and the 2 in parallel, the simple formula, you just add them up. 4 plus 2 is 6 microfarads. So these two are just equivalent to 6 microfarads. So we can, instead of looking at that, we can simply replace that with a 6 microfarad capacitor. So we've got now a 12 and a 6 microfarad capacitor. 12 and 6 in series, we have to use our 1 over formula. So 1 over the equivalent will equal 1 over 12 plus 1 over 6, which equals common denominator 12. 12 into 12 goes once, plus 6 into 12 goes twice, which equals 3 over 12. That is not the answer. That is 1 over C. So to get the answer, we have to flip them both upside down and we end up with C equals 12 over 3, which equals 4 microfarads. So the whole of that is equivalent to 4 microfarads. What we did was we looked at the picture and we saw that we could divide it into two, a couple of capacitors in parallel, and then one in series. We worked out what those are equivalent to, and then we said, so it's that in series with that, and we used the 1 over formula to work out that the total capacitance of all that is 4 microfarads. Now, let's connect our three capacitors like this, the 4 and the 2 in series in parallel with the 12. So, how are we going to calculate the total result of all that? Well, if we look at it, we first of all think those are in series with each other. So I can add them up to find a 1 equivalent. And since they're in series, it's the 1 over formula. So 1 over the equivalent of those two will equal 1 over 4 plus 1 over 2 which equals common denominator 4, 4 into 4 goes once, 2 into 4 goes twice, equals 3 over 4. That is not the answer, because remember it's the 1 over formula. So that's 1 over C equals 3 over 4, therefore C equals 4 over 3, which equals 1 and a third microfarads. So, Instead of those two in series, we can replace them, if this works. I've actually, in order to wipe the whiteboard, I've put a bit of hand sanitizer on the cloth, and it's got alcohol in it, so it's very effective. I can replace those two by a simple one and one third microfarad there. And now it's dead easy, because big C, 
the result of that, they're in parallel, so it's the simply adding up formula. So C will equal 1 and 1 third plus 12, which equals 13 and 1 third microfarads. So what did I do? I took the two capacitors that were there in series, and I worked out what they were equivalent to using the 1 over formula. And they were equivalent to one capacitor of 1 and a third microfarads. So I rubbed them out and I put one capacitor of 1 and a third microfarads there. Now that is in parallel with that, dead easy, parallel capacitors, just add them together. So the total of that is simply 1 and a third plus 12, which equals 13 and a third microfarads. So instead of this complicated arrangement of having a capacitor there and another capacitor there, sorry, not very good at drawing, I can simply replace all that by one capacitor of 13 and a third microfarads. Now, I've only looked at adding up two capacitors in series or parallel. What happens if actually you get a problem with three capacitors, all in series or all in parallel? Let's just look at that as a last example. Let's look at three capacitors in series. And because they're in series, I have to use the 1 over formula. So, the formula tells me that 1 over big C, namely what single capacitor would replace those, will equal 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. And I have checked that each capacitor, its value is given in the same units microfarads, microfarads, microfarads. If it's not, you have to change it so that they're all in the same units. Now, if I look at that, common denominator is 120. 20 into 120 goes six times, plus 30 into 120 goes four times, and 40 into 120 goes three times. So the answer there is 13 over 120. But remember, that isn't the answer. That is 1 over C. So to find C, I have to flip the two ends. C will equal 120 over 13, which, if I do a quick mental bit of arithmetic, 13 into 120 comes out at 9.32 microfarads. So the one capacitor that would replace all those three is 9.32 microfarads. And you just have to be a little bit more careful with your one over calculations if you've got three capacitors there. Of course, if those three capacitors were in parallel, Same capacitors in parallel, 20, 30, 40 microfarads, 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 check your units. Then in parallel, it's simply the adding up formula. So C will simply equal 20 plus 30 plus 40. 20 and 30 is 50 plus 40 is 90 microfarads. Now, there is an easy way of checking whether your answer is wrong. If you've got capacitors in series, the total capacitance will be smaller than any one of the capacitances. I'll repeat that. If they're in series, the total capacitance will be less than any one of the capacitors. 
So it comes out at 9.32, which is less than 20, less than 30, less than 40. That's if they're in series. You reduce the total capacitance. If they're in parallel, the capacitances are total capacitance will be greater than, bigger than any one of the individual ones because they're all adding up to the capacity of energy that can be carried. So you see these, 20, 30, and 40, they give me a total capacitance of 90. So in parallel, the total capacitance will be bigger than any one of the individual ones. And that allows you very quickly to check whether you've made a mistake in your answer. It won't tell you your answer is correct, but it will tell you if your answer is wrong. And that's a useful thing to remember. So capacitors in series, capacitors in parallel, not too difficult as long, especially with the series one, to remember to do the flip at the end. And if ever you're wandering around and not thinking about capacitors, just look for a motor car with its indicator light flashing. What makes a motor car indicator light flash? Answer, a capacitor in the electric circuit of the motor car makes the indicator lights flash. So capacitors would sh be, should be in your mind whenever you're walking down the street and seeing a motor car with the indicator lights flashing, as well as when you're using your mobile phone and when you're using your iPad. Capacitors are everywhere. Good luck with your learning about capacitors. And remember to look in your textbook and also access the internet with a bit more information about capacitors as well. Bye.